Grove explained his dilemma to a class at Stanford Business School at the time. I have three options, Dennis Carter, then head of marketing, became nearly hysterical at the prospect of Intel abandoning consumers in this way. Especially since Intel had begun to invest heavily in its brand. Starting with the Red X campaign that promoted the 386 chip.10 Craig Kinney, who headed Intel's architectural research lab, and Pat Gelsinger, the young manager of the 80486 project, also rejected the risk strategy, arguing that RISCS technical benefits were grossly overstated. As Gelsinger later recalled, he and Kinney were absolutely adamant that compatibility carries the day. 11. When Frank Gill, head of Intel system business in the 1990, reflected on this debate, he concluded that rejecting risk was possibly the most courageous decision Grove had ever made. He had the courage to go against everybody. 12. When Grove looked back, he highlighted not the courage it took to make that decision but how obvious it seemed in retrospect. How could I even have considered walking away from a traditional technology that then had go for the mass? Market Andy Grove took a decade longer than Bill Gates to conclude that his company should focus on building industry platforms, not just standalone products. Steve Jobs took more than 20 years to come to a similar realization. We can do things the other guy can't do. 14. Giving up any of this control, he argued, would result in inferior products. If you have an extreme passion for producing great products, it pushes you to be integrated, to connect your hardware and your software and content management. If you want to allow your products to be open to other hardware or software. You have to give up some of your vision. Point one five. Ironically, the success of Apple's products always depended on the availability of software developed by third parties, and the Macintosh might have disappeared from the market, like Sony's Betamax VCR, if Microsoft, Adobe, and a few other companies had not provided key applications for word processing, spreadsheets, and desktop publishing. Point one six. Nonetheless, Apple did little to promote the Macintosh as a broad industry platform. What do you think is the right price? David thought for a minute and said DOS was selling to computer companies for about $15 in. Windows was roughly a $15 add-on. So Next should sell for $25 to $35 if it wanted to get broad adoption and become an important platform. Fred Anderson, former Apple's foe, recalled that the senior leadership wanted to open up the iPod to the broader world, but Jobs said, No, I don't want to do that. 19 jobs reportedly declared at one point that Windows users would get iPods over my dead body. 20 a senior Apple engineering executive John Rubenstein explained to us. Steve didn't do things for the PC. The PC was the enemy. Steve said, no, no, we are not doing it. This is the digital hub strategy. Eventually, however, Jobs's executive team wore him down. In addition, most successful industry platforms are relatively open and modular, which make it easier for producers of complementary products and services to add their own innovations. 25 in terms of price, openness, and modularity. The iPhone and iPad ranked low compared to phones and tablets based on Google's Android operating system, which debuted in 2007. The success of Apple's App Store, built on what we might call a closed, but not closed, platform strategy, as opposed to Microsoft's open, but not open, strategy, which we discuss below. 
helped turn the iPhone and iPad into platforms far beyond what the Macintosh ever achieved. If we do innovation in the processor, and Microsoft or independent software parties don't do a corresponding innovation, our innovation will be worthless. 28 In other words, prosperity in a platform business depends not simply on the strength of one's own products but on the innovations of other firms, sometimes including bitter rivals, and relationships that are destructive don't help anybody in this industry. 29 At the time, Jobs was justifying his decision to drop Apple's lawsuits against Microsoft for copying the Macintosh interface and to accept a major investment from his arch rival Bill Gates. Apple sold complete systems but faced a similar conundrum. Even if company engineers designed great computers without great peripherals, for example, printers and software drivers, great third party software applications, and a well oiled supply chain for components and assembly. Apple could not offer the consumer a complete solution and great user experience, as Grove acknowledged in a 2003 interview. Intel executives in the 1970 and early 1980 were chip heads who did not truly understand the importance of industry platforms and ecosystem software partners like Microsoft.30 Grove himself was largely stuck in the product model of strategy rather than the platform model. By the late 1980, however, after Intel introduced the 386 microprocessor, Grove was beginning to understand that his company needed to engage at a higher level with other firms that were crucial to Intel's long-term success as a first step. Grove appointed Craig Kinney in 1991 to head the new Intel Architecture Lab and make Intel the architect for the open computer industry. 31 He charged Kinney and his team with finding ways to overcome the technical deficiencies in the PC that made it difficult to deploy new applications as a sign of his commitment to this effort. Grove empowered Kinney to expand the lab which grew to 500 engineers, mostly software programmers, under his successor, David Johnson. By 2001.32 the lab's first big effort was the Peripheral Component Interconnect PCI initiative in order to improve the PCS ability to handle graphics, help it connect easily with printers and other peripherals and resolve related performance issues. Kinney's engineers designed a new bus architecture and chipset to work alongside Intel's microprocessor, yet according to Grove, smaller PC makers, which did not have the engineering resources to design their own chipsets, welcomed the move for the smaller OEMS. This was wonderful because it gave them an opportunity to compete for a larger audience on the same footing as the bigger PC makers. 34 The PCI initiative was only the beginning. Grove's philosophy, as described to us by his former technical assistant Rene James, was simple. If you grow the whole thing and we take our fair share, then the whole industry grows. 36 This led to Grove's decision to make most of these innovations relatively open and often free. Steve Jobs also understood the importance of growing the pie. But he took a different tack toward his ecosystem partners. He wanted to solve their problems and then charge for the privilege of using Apple's tightly controlled platforms and elegant technical solutions. If ecosystem partners did not design new hardware around DOS and Windows, or develop new software applications that ran on Microsoft's operating system, customers would have little reason to buy new computers or upgrade their operating systems, and demand for Windows would stagnate, starting with the first version of DOS in 1981. 
Microsoft encouraged such investment by essentially giving away its software developer kits, which provided enough information and sample code for manufacturers to build PCS and for software developers to write applications, like Intel. Microsoft also introduced innovations that benefited the entire industry, such as technologies that facilitated networking or sped up the software writing process by making it easier to reuse large pieces of code. Point three seven. These efforts helped drive the proliferation of millions of Windows applications by the end of the 1990. In the late 1990. The U.S. Department of Justice accused Microsoft of giving special advantages to Microsoft's own applications developers, a charge that gained plausibility from Gates's admission in a 1995 media interview that there was no Chinese wall between Microsoft's operating systems and applications groups. Point three nine competitors, including IBM, Lotus. WordPerfect and Netscape all claimed that they received information on new versions of Windows later than Microsoft's application groups, in contrast to Andy Grove, who invested heavily to grow the overall pie for everyone, and to Steve Jobs, who fought to preserve Apple's exclusivity and control. Gates managed to have the best of both worlds for a very long time. However, when platform leaders decide to play on both sides of the market, platform and complements, they run the risk of creating major conflicts with their partners, violating their trust, and making them less likely to invest in a business over which they have little control. But by 1993, as Grove told his senior leadership team, the attitude of all but the largest companies had changed too, if not Intel. Who else will do it? As a result, Intel shipped almost 50% of its Pentium chips with Intel-made motherboards, accelerating the time to market for this new product and generating dramatic profits for both Intel and its leading PC customers. Point four three bring the big profit centers in-house while Grove moved Intel into producing complements primarily to solve its chicken and egg problem. Gates saw the market for complements to Microsoft's operating system, notably application software, as a huge profit center in its own right. Although Excel initially lagged behind Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Early versions of Word were much less popular than WordPerfect. Microsoft captured as much as 95% of the desktop productivity applications market after bundling Word, Excel, and PowerPoint to create Office in 1990.45 eventually. Applications became Microsoft's largest and most profitable business, but this close connection to the past creates an innovator's dilemma for platform strategists. How to preserve what is important to existing customers and complementers without becoming obsolete. Point four eight Gates, Grove, and Jobs all worried about how much and how quickly to evolve their platforms way underestimated the strength of an architectural ecosystem and the costs of an architectural conversion. 51 Grove knew that the project was going badly. But, as he later acknowledged, he did not understand all the technical details. And his managers were unwilling to pull the plug on their own. It'll be because we're too focused on the internet. 55 recognized the need for new platforms. Both Gates and Grove fell short. Particularly in comparison to Jobs. When it came to seizing the opportunity offered by the rapid growth of new non-PC platforms in only one case did Microsoft find the courage to do something that wasn't PC-centric. The Xbox gaming platform, developed beginning in the late 1990 and first released in 2001.57 like Intel, 
Microsoft ended up missing or coming late to many of the most important new platform introductions of the next decade, notably in digital media players, smartphones, and tablets, as well as software as a service and cloud computing. Not until November 1985 did Apple release an emulation program that allowed Macs to run a few non-copyrighted Apple II applications.59 with subsequent platform changes. Apple made slightly greater efforts to ease the transition for customers, but they paled in comparison to the full-scale commitment to backward and forward compatibility demonstrated by Microsoft and Intel. This made it possible for consumers to continue using their old Mac software, but at much slower speed due to the extra programming layer that was involved. Point six zero similarly. In 2006, when Jobs ended Apple's 20-year partnership with IBM and Motorola in order to switch to an Intel chip, Apple bundled emulation software with its new Macs so that users could run their old software, but Jobs rejected this approach because his dream was to have one OS across everything, according to John Rubenstein.61 What's more, he hated open source. As Rubenstein explained, he was very worried about IP, that someone would come after us later on and we'd have to give away our technology. Consequently, Apple engineers created iOS by removing multitasking and other features from the Mac OS X. Successful industry platforms like DOS, Windows or the Intel x86 microprocessor line create huge recurring revenue streams. What Bill Gates in 1994 referred to as annuities, resulting from network externalities. The more successful the platform, the more difficult it becomes to risk the revenues and profits it generates by making major changes or moving on to something entirely new. Although leading companies are likely to hold on to their old platforms for too long, there is also a paradox here. The less successful a platform is in terms of broad industry adoption, the greater the incentives for the platform company to innovate and try something new. Overall, we learn from Gates, Grove, and Jobs that platform strategy is really about understanding choices and trade offs. Whether to put more emphasis on standalone products or on partnerships that could grow the pie for everyone and potentially lead to a more dominant and enduring market position for the platform. Leader and its partners, Arthur Rock, one of Silicon Valley's most famous venture capitalists and an early investor in both Intel and Apple, once wrote, Uddharan Chin, S. Strategy is easy, but tactics, the day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month decisions required to manage a business, are hard. One some source may be tempted to delegate this hard work to subordinates, but not Bill Gates, Andy Grove, and Steve Jobs. We call this tactic the puppy dog ploy, borrowing a term from two well-known economists, Drew Feudenberg and Jean Tirole. Winner of the 2014 Nobel Prize in Economics.5 The goal is to look as inoffensive as possible so that stronger players will either fail to notice you or choose to leave you alone. He claimed that everyone expected there to be at least two or three competitors to iTunes. And the labels thought they had all the power because Jobs only got one or two year contracts for the music and they could have pulled their licenses at any time. I don't think the labels were afraid of him. Because Steve was just a guy with an idea. It ironically. This laid-back attitude helped Jobs in the tough negotiations over the terms of participation in iTunes. The labels wanted music sold as albums for a higher price. Jobs wanted to sell individual tracks at 99 cents each as early as 1981.
When Jobs got word of an upcoming InfoWorld story on Apple's three new development projects, he called the reporter and chewed him out, saying that even revealing the project's code names, Lisa, Macintosh, and Dinah, later the Apple EA, would give a key advantage to his competitors, when John Rubenstein headed up the team developing the iPod. No more than 100 other people at Apple even knew the project existed. Point one one, as Rubenstein said. In 2000, we have cells, like a terrorist organization. 12. This obsession with secrecy extended to Apple's supply chain, and Munster was only one of many analysts and reporters who found themselves on the receiving end of Apple misinformation. Point one five. Walt Mossberg, the veteran technology reporter, interviewed Jobs in June 2003 for the Wall Street Journal's first annual All Things Digital conference. It's about music. He told Mossberg he was not convinced that people want to watch movies on a tiny little display they carry around, and dismissed photos and video on portable devices as a speculative market. But just over a year later, Apple released an iPod with a color screen for viewing photos, and an iPod with video capability followed in 2005. Similarly, when it came to tablets, which Bill Gates was promoting at the time, albeit with a stylus, Jobs told Mossberg, people want keyboards, adding, we look at the tablet and we think it's going to fail. Pressed about the tablet as a reading device, Jobs acknowledged that it would be superior to a laptop but insisted that the only market for it would be a bunch of rich guys who can afford their third computer on top of a desktop and a laptop. In reality, however, Tablets were a frequent topic of discussion within Apple.16 according to a Tevanian. Apple had been experimenting with a touch keyboard and tablet as early as 2002, 17 and John. Rubenstein confirmed that, by 2003, Apple was investing in multi-touch technology for tablets.18 since Apple filed a patent for a tablet device in March 2004. The company obviously had not written off the tablet as of the summer of 2003.19 even after Apple released the iPad in 2010. Jobs continued to mislead the market about his plans for the device. In a January 2011 email, iTunes head Eddie Q wrote that he had expressed his favorable view of smaller tablets to Steve several times since Thanksgiving and he seemed very receptive the last time. 21 This process eventually led to the release of a smaller tablet, the iPad mini, in late 2012, the most expensive phone in the world. And it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard. We are selling millions of phones a year. And Apple is selling zero. 23. We have to let go of this notion that for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. His approach reminds us of the old adage, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Given IBM's size, resources, and power is the historical standard setter. It could have decided early in the industry's history to produce its own PC operating system leaving Microsoft out in the cold. Company executives who were ready to say, the hell with. Microsoft, pushed forward the development of a new operating system called CP-DOS.26 IBM engineers were also working on a product called TopView, a potential competitor to Windows that Gates later described as, one of many attempts to design us. Out of business. 27. In response to these moves, Gates pitched IBM hard on Microsoft's plans for successive versions of DOS and Windows. What we're going to do for the next couple of years is play rats in a maze, 28. Trying one option after another. 
as if they wanted to make the relationship work but knowing that they were all likely to be dead. Ends. In return, Apple agreed to make Explora the default web browser for the Macintosh operating system.29 even. Though Apple had only a tiny slice of the computer market, Microsoft saw this agreement as an important part of its campaign to make IE the dominant web browser. This is about getting Apple healthy. And this is about Apple being able to make incredibly great contributions to the industry. To get healthy and prosper again.30 As Jobs told Wall Street Journal reporter Walt Mossberg 10. Years later, if the game was a zero-sum game where for Apple to win, Microsoft had to lose, then Apple was going to lose. 31 at the time. Apple was struggling to survive. Apple's share of the desktop market had slipped to 2.8%. And the company had lost $1.6 billion over the previous 18 months.32 The deal not only provided Apple with a cash infusion and resolved a long-running legal dispute. But it was also a vote of confidence in Apple's future. We would have been dead. Because you couldn't do anything without office. 33 In fact, by signing the agreement, Gates may have made a colossal tactical error. If Gates had not bailed out jobs, Apple might not have been around to harass Microsoft a decade later and eventually to replace it as the most valuable company of all time. 35 And his prescription for MobileMe, the predecessor to iCloud, was no more complex. Strategy. Catch up to Google Cloud services and leapfrog them. Photo stream. Cloud storage. 36. Similarly, Andy Grove followed the competitions led in the early 1990. When Intel faced a major threat in the form of RISC chips. High performance microprocessors based on a competing technology. More traditional tactics also. Played an important role. For example, one step in Microsoft's war plan was to get 80% of top websites to target our client. Internet Explorer. Dot Uddharan Chin. And in order to achieve this goal, Gates planned to draw directly on Microsoft's strength. In a famous memo, published by the Department of Justice, Microsoft's stated strategy was, we need to go to the top five sites and ask them. What can we do to get you to adopt IE? We should be prepared to write a check. Buy sites. Or add features. Basically do whatever it takes. 40 source. How to get to 30% share in 12 months. Microsoft internal memo. United States v. Microsoft Corporation. Civil action no gates immediately began to tell computer manufacturers that Microsoft was developing its own GUI, which at that point was little more than an idea hastily dubbed interface manager. He urged customers not to sign any deals with Visicorp until they saw Microsoft's product. In January 1983, Gates hinted that Microsoft would ship its product before VC on got to market. A prediction that turned out to be off by two years.42 and in April, Microsoft presented one of the most elusive demonstrations of all time, a mock-up of a screen with several overlapping windows running different programs, none of which did anything by late 1984. The Financial Times reported that Microsoft Windows had attracted considerable industry support from application software companies, even though it had not yet come to market a year after its announcement. Point four four Windows remained just around the corner, always weeks away from shipment throughout 1984 and most of 1985, until it finally shipped in November. In 1991, Intel announced 30 new versions of its 386 and 486 microprocessors. 
with the goal of covering the vast majority of its customers' needs. 46 AMD had previously made successful inroads into Intel's market by introducing new products, such as higher speed parts in plastic packages. Apple eventually sold as many as 32 variations, different colors, configurations, and prices of this relatively expensive computer over the next four years. 48 with the iPod. Jobs took a page from Grove's playbook and went much further. He evolved the media player into a family of products with different features for different users and a wider range of price points. Apple justified the price by pointing to its superior design and ease of use as well as the unique combination of small size and large capacity. Captured in the tagline, a thousand songs in your pocket. Some industry critics, unimpressed, declared that, iPod, stood for, idiots price our devices. But they were soon silenced when Apple broke with company tradition by releasing a range of models to cover different price points in user preferences, leaving no space for competitors to gain a foothold. The Mac is important to us and to our sales. 51. The threat may have been a bluff. Macintosh applications were indeed a crucial business for Microsoft at that time. And Gates wanted to dominate that market. But it was enough to bring Scully around. In return, Gates agreed to continue developing Microsoft applications for the Mac and to delay the release of Excel for the PC for a year. To give the Macintosh version time to make its way into the business market, it was already in Microsoft's best interest to continue selling Word and Excel for the Mac. And the PC version of Excel was two years away from release.52 by playing hardball. Gates had extracted a valuable concession from Apple in return for doing things Microsoft was going to do anyway. In one of their earliest conversations in 1993, when Microsoft was thinking about entering the online services business, Gates reportedly said, I can buy 20% of you or I can buy all of you or I can go into this business myself and bury you. 54 Three years later, Gates had no hesitation about using Microsoft's considerable resources to court AOL. Apple under jobs. In the words of one longtime observer, Uddharan Chin ran roughshod over its partners and competitors. 56 from the moment he returned to Apple in 1997. Jobs started playing the heavy. According to John Rubenstein, in negotiations, Steve never left a nickel on the table. But the strategic value of an Apple bookstore is very high. 60 in a memo outlining the deal for other HarperCollins executives, Murray admitted. We fought the pricing caps and the commission to the bitter end and lost. 61 losing was also a common experience for negotiators who faced off against Andy Grove. However, the FTC would only enforce such a ban if that customer agrees in writing not to seek an injunction and is not seeking or has sought compensation, damages or any other legal or equitable remedies. 63 in effect. The FTC banned Intel from using Grove's approach. Unless a customer did the same thing as DEC. Even though Microsoft had signed a consent decree with the U.S. Department of Justice. Doge. In 1994, company executives did not believe that it placed significant limits on their freedom of action. Arguing that the objectives of that agreement were limited, in the words of Microsoft's associate, General Counsel.65 when we interviewed Steve Ballmer in 1998, the year he became Microsoft's president, we urged him to consider antitrust training. But he balked, saying that it would take the edge off the sales force.66 senior management, including Gates. 
did not get religion on antitrust policy until it was almost too late. When the Doge went after Microsoft again in 1998, it nearly broke up the company, Jobs, it turned out, had threatened Palm executives with patent lawsuits if they did not stop recruiting Apple employees. And, according to an email by Google's Sergey Brin, Jobs called him and screamed, if you hire a single one of these people that means war. 67 The Doge case was settled in 2012. If Andy Grove had not aggressively invested in engineering and manufacturing in the early 1992, fill the holes in his microprocessor line, Intel never would have retained its 80% worldwide market share which was key to the company's short- and long-term revenues and profits, Gates brought to Microsoft. A deep understanding of software as a technology and as a business. Grove brought to Intel an intense commitment to instill engineering-like discipline in management and operations. And Jobs brought to Apple a unique sense of product design with an intuitive understanding of how to make complex technology accessible to the non-technical person. He also believed that technology provided the foundation for a pioneering and potentially lucrative business model. Selling software products.5 In the late 1960s, when Gates discovered computers as a middle school student, most companies in the industry made their money either by selling hardware systems or by selling software services. Writing programs from scratch to solve the problems of each customer one by one. In addition, he recruited talented software engineers and product managers from Apple, Xerox Park, and other companies when Microsoft began to move into the consumer market in the early 1982 provide applications for the Macintosh as well as DOS PCS. A passion for discipline Andy Grove's personal anchor was not based on a specific skill like software coding. Rather, his greatest asset was the engineering-like discipline of a highly educated scientist who was equally at home at a university or a Fortune 500 company. In anything he does, whether he's thinking about strategy, thinking it through, or whether it's operational, was at the heart of Grove's approach to leadership at Intel.8 V. Noted earlier that Grove began his career as a chemical engineer, graduating from City College in New York and then completing a PhD at Berkeley. He admitted to us that he never had the entrepreneurial drive that Gates and Jobs displayed. Which is why he did not himself establish a company. Point nine, however, he had little fear of risk, as he showed by venturing alone from Hungary to America at the age of 20 and leaving Fairchild Semiconductor with Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore in 1968 to become Intel's first employee, with the help of co founder Steve Wozniak and other Apple engineers and managers. He translated this aesthetic sense into radical new product designs and user interfaces. First for personal computers and then for other products and services like the iPod, iPhone, and iPad, as well as iTunes, the App Store, and iCloud. For example, the iPod might have languished in the marketplace if Sfo Fred Anderson had not stopped him from buying Universal Music in the early 2000s, or if his team had not browbeat him to make the iPod compatible with Windows in 2003. I went in and took every statement that anybody else had written in BASIC and rewrote it myself, just because I didn't like the way they coded. 20 well into the 1990. Gates continued to astonish company engineers with his grasp of programming details. You go into meetings and you come out just sweating because if there is any flaw, he will land on it immediately and pick it to bits. 21 This unrelenting attention to technical 
Details during the 1980 and through at least the mid-1990 kept Microsoft's developers and executives constantly on their toes. It was possible for Gates to take this approach because for much of his tenure as CEO, he had the skills to understand Microsoft's products at the lowest levels. The code and algorithms 22 although the technology had outstripped Gates's personal programming experience by the mid-1990, he still knew what questions to ask and learn new things easily. As Gates told Kusumano and Selby, in 1993, the products that comprise 80% of our revenues I choose to understand very, very deeply. 23 He continued to work directly with these product teams, helping to define new versions and features as best he could, especially when they faced new challenges, such as networking and the internet. In addition, Gates maintained tight control over investment decisions for new product development. I have not delegated the general idea of products to develop. That is a good decision for a CEO of a software company to keep in his hands. 24 for less critical products. Rather than exercise direct oversight, Gates relied on the major program reviews and planning sessions held in April and October each year. It's easy then just to shoot off a piece of mail and say, Come on. I thought I asked to get drag and drop into this thing. And I don't see it in the status report. 25 This oversight system worked well for several years. But its success required Gates's full attention, expertise, and force of will. The Windows group grew increasingly large and disorganized. Leading to such fiascos as the five-year delay in releasing Windows Vista which involved as many as 7,000 engineers and finally shipped in 2007.26 in addition. Microsoft badly misjudged the market opportunities in mobile devices and online services opened up by Apple's iPhone and iPad. In 2014, Microsoft's newly appointed CEO, Satya Nadella, asked Gates to return to a more active role in the company. Serving as a mentor and advisor for product strategy.27 and still disciplined with attention to detail. Steve Jobs's focus on design was just as intense as Gates's focus on software. Cordell Ratzlaff, the project lead, remembered that Jobs would scrutinize everything down to the pixel level. Jobs even wanted the scroll bars on the windows to look a certain way forcing the team to present multiple versions in a process that took almost six months.29 during this process and continuing through the 2000 jobs worked hand in hand with lead designer jonathan johnny ive and his team that's how you get discipline 31 as a result according to one member of apple's elite industrial design team it was common in apple to Obsess over every detail. 32 Beyond Design. Marketing was Jobs's other great passion, and here again he showed extraordinary attention to detail. He did the same for the iPad in 2010, shooting down multiple suggestions before Apple's ad agency let him personally articulate the tone, style, and voice that would guide the advertising campaign. Point three three jobs also oversaw the layout of Apple's retail stores, from their high-level design down to the materials used in their construction. Consequently, Intel's early planning process called for middle managers to prepare their own strategy plans and then show them to Grove and other senior executives who then asked the hard questions about goals, resources, and competition, but without mandating a higher-level direction for managers to follow. Until then, the company's goal had been simple, to produce bigger and better semiconductor memories ahead of the competition, in Grove's words.36. But, 
By the mid 1980, the industry had changed and microprocessors, not memories, were capturing most of the value. What we needed was a balanced interaction between the middle managers, with their deep knowledge but narrow focus, and senior management, whose larger perspective could set a context.38 Grove's solution, after becoming CEO in 1987, was to turn the SLRP, strategic long-range planning, process that we discussed in chapter 1 on its head, then, in the broader management meetings, rather than hear first from line managers, Grove would begin with his assessment of the environment, followed by his statement of the company's strategy and four or so high-level strategic mandates that he expected everyone to adopt. After discussion and refinement, this defined the strategy for all of the groups, and it provided a strategic framework for different groups at different levels of management. 39. However, Grove did not abandon his earlier belief that middle managers should have the authority to make key decisions on their own. Throughout this process, Grove continued to act on the conviction that good strategic thinking requires different points of view and clarifying those different points of view requires intensive ongoing debate involving the executive team and domain experts inside and outside the company, Makula taught jobs about business plans, marketing, and the need to focus on doing one thing really well for the customer. Point four two jobs also learned a great deal at Pixar about making movies and graphics. And once he returned to Apple, he often consulted Jimmy Irvine about the ins and outs of the music business. Similarly, when he recognized in the late 1980 that Intel was no longer a broadline semiconductor company, Grove threw himself into understanding computers, sales, and consumer marketing, relying heavily on Intel managers such as Les Vadas and Dennis Carter as well as outside experts and board members. More than 20 years later, Grove still remembered learning that a brand is a promise from David Arkers, a marketing professor at Berkeley's Haas School of Business whom Carter had brought in to give a talk.43 But it is Bill Gates who became best known for dedicating time for thinking and learning in one such week. For example, Gates tackled the evolution of natural language interfaces and reportedly read 112 articles in technical papers on topics ranging from the theory of language and cutting-edge computer science to trends in education. Point four four Gates also routinely wrote four or five major memos each year, often during his think weeks. Sometimes they analyzed tactical issues such as improving customer support, which became a major challenge in the early 1990s as the number of Windows customers surged from tens of thousands to tens of millions.45 most of the time. Though, he offered high-level strategic commentary on the biggest challenges facing Microsoft, Russ Siegelman, who ran the MSN Group in the early 1990 gave us this account of how Gates thought at the time. He combined his knowledge of how markets work and why people buy stuff, and how you beat the competition, with this insight into technology that was really unique. So he didn't start thinking about the next thing until he finished the last one. 47 Typically, jobs concentrated on one product at a time such as the new Macintosh, or the iPod, or the iPhone, before going on to his next big thing. Once he had moved on, Jobs knew he could rely on the team behind him to finish the current product and join him. Afterward, there was always, okay, we're at the fork in the road. Which one do we take? 48 in other words. Apple's corporate strategy emerged from Jobs' vision and product plans.
implemented one at a time. Rather than from an Intel-like technology roadmap or a Microsoft-style three-year plan, the one also encouraged the entire senior leadership team to pay close attention to how the company overall, rather than a particular product division, was going to make money. Point five one jobs also presided over weekly meetings of the executive team, which kept the organization on track and tightly coordinated albeit highly dependent on his ability to keep people in sync. Steve was kind of the one who knitted it all together. That's why the product lineup looks so perfect in many ways. As close to perfect as a brand can be from every touch point. 52. It was very unusual in a multi-billion dollar company for a CEO to eliminate product divisions and to maintain direct oversight of nearly everything that touched the customer. Apple is still in a transition period as Cook, Ives, and other members of Apple's senior leadership team seek to retain the best of what Jobs had brought to the company. His passion for design elegance and attention to detail, and his ability to champion category-defining innovations while making Apple the company less dependent on any one individual. Steve Ballmer. For example, the high-energy salesman and corporate cheerleader was the perfect complement to Bill Gates. The reflective, often sarcastic software nerd. 54 in Paul Maritz's words. Bill Gates was all about strategy and the platform, whereas Steve Ballmer was all about competition. Beating the other guy. The soul of Steve is competition. In addition, after becoming CEO in 1987, he appointed other executives to handle tasks for which he had no particular affinity. 56 for example. Grove recalled in 2013 that Craig Barrett, his COO and ultimate successor, took charge of manufacturing traveling to out-of-the-way places and doing a lot of the things I hated. 57 but of the three. Steve Jobs was probably the most dependent on his executive team and other company experts. As he told his biographer, what I'm best at doing is finding a group of talented people and making things with them. 58 Fred Anderson, Apple's four under Jobs, noted. Steve wanted to control whatever touched the customer. Whether it was the gi of the operating system, the fit and finish of applications that Apple did, the industrial design, the packaging of the products, the advertising. That's where his passion was and that's where he spent his time. He had little interest in other activities that were critical to the company, including finance, Jobs later said. I realized that he and I saw things exactly the same way. Tim had the same strategic vision I did. And we could interact at a high strategic level. And I could just forget about a lot of things unless he came and pinged me. 61 Cook took over sales and customer support in 2000 and the Macintosh hardware division in 2004. Johnny and I think up most of the products together and then pull others in and say, Hey, what do you think about this? 65 In 2005, Jobs promoted Ive to Senior Vice President of Industrial Design, reporting directly to the CEO and at the same level as Rubenstein. John Rubenstein received one million stock options merely to sign up. 68 Johnson got 600,000 shares worth about 100 times what he would make in a good year at his previous employer. Target point six nine for most of the executive's jobs courted. Joining him at Apple and then staying for a while was not a hard decision. Especially in the boom years when the iPod and iTunes were followed by the iPhone and the iPad and Apple became the most valuable company in the world. Similarly, Steve Jobs liked to say that a players hire a players, and bees hire C's.
which leads eventually to a bozo explosion. 70. The solution to this problem was to hire only a players, a task that became increasingly difficult as Microsoft and Apple grew. Ideally, each will respect the other for what he or she brings to the party and will not be intimidated by the other's knowledge or position. Point 72. Listening only to senior executives, no matter how capable they are can leave a CEO dangerously isolated from what is really going on inside the company as well as outside in the marketplace. Grove always feared this would happen to him and blamed this kind of isolation for his slow response to the Pentium crisis in 1994.73 as a countermeasure. Grove brought new, younger people into his inner circle including David Yoffe, then only 34 years old, whom he invited to join Intel's board. Grove called the latter, helpful Cassandras, and expected them to bring him new perspectives in news, especially bad news, from outside his usual information sources. Point seven forecast a wide net for information Bill Gates similarly looked for diverse sources of information as well as negative reports. Once writing, sometimes I think my most important job as a CEO is to listen for bad news. 75 But he cast a wider net than Grove, frequently going outside Microsoft to find technical experts who could fill the gaps in his skills and experience. In the 1980 and 1990, these hires included, as just a small sample, Charles Simony from Xerox Park, a Stanford PhD in computer science who studied applications design as well as programming methods. Nathan Mayachavald, a Princeton physics PhD who had studied with Nobel Prize winner Stephen Hawking. Brad Silverberg, a software engineer who had worked at Apple and Bolland before heading the Windows 95 project in, then founding a new Internet Platforms and Tools division. And Paul Maritz, a software engineer who had previously worked at Intel and would go on to lead the Windows division. Gates felt he had never failed at anything important and wanted people around him who could sense the signs of corporate failure before it occurred to Microsoft. Point seven six Gates also encouraged information to flow freely among Microsoft employees by creating an open culture based mainly on email. In early 1994, a young Microsoft engineer named Jay Allard began emailing Gates about this new thing called the World Wide Web. Point seven eight at the time. Gates and other executives were preoccupied with rolling out Windows NT and Windows 95, as well as a proprietary online network, MSN, to compete with AOL. Two other young managers began to email Gates urging action on the internet. Ben Slivka, who was heading the last of the DOS development projects, and would later lead the first three Internet Explorer projects and Steven Sinofsky, who had been Gates's technical assistant and was moving to the office group, and would later become president of the Windows division. The best example was this guy, Jay Allard, who was a junior developer or in program management in the MSN group, who basically ended up not only driving but eventually managing a lot of the internet-related software for the company. Bill figured out this guy was really smart. He knows what's going on. 80 in his 1999 book. Business at the Speed of Thought. Gates acknowledged the importance of this lower level input. The impetus for Microsoft's response to the internet didn't come from me or from our other senior executives through our electronic mail systems. They were able to rally everybody to their cause. Gates ended his comments with words that mirror Grove's point about giving organization power to people with knowledge power. Their story exemplifies our policy. From day one, 
that smart people anywhere in the company should have the power to drive an initiative. 81 Gates's key partner was Steve Ballmer, but he also worked closely with many other managers and engineers. Grove relied heavily on Craig Barrett, as well as other key executives, and Jobs had a long list of partners, including the current CEO, Tim Cook, and head of design Johnny Ive. At the same time, we can trace many of the limitations that Microsoft, Intel, and Apple have displayed in recent years to the decisions that Gates, Grove, and Jobs made as well as to the cultures and business models they established. This means setting priorities so you don't get thrown off track, ensuring that you cultivate the capabilities required to satisfy customers' needs. Taking steps, such as building barriers to entry, to thwart competitors' moves, and most critically, moving early and decisively to build a competitive edge on those rare occasions when you glimpse a 10x change in the offing. Eventually, as it became clear that the computing world was undergoing a radical shift into what we now call the cloud, this goal coalesced into a vision of Google as a universal provider of internet-based products and services, all funded by advertising. In 2014, Android market share hit 80%, more than five times the share of Apple's iOS, and Google's market value climbed close to $400 billion.3 Mark Zuckerberg Platform thinking in the finest tradition Mark Zuckerberg followed a path that was remarkably similar to that of Bill Gates. Zuckerberg's ambitions for the platform were bold from the start. At the time, he told an interviewer, We want to make Facebook into something of an operating system, so you can run full applications. 5. This move transformed Facebook from a Nietzsche phenomenon into a global franchise, with a rapidly growing user base and ecosystem of partners, advertisers, and application developers, while MySpace counted 50 million users in 2014. Facebook had grown to more than 1.3 billion, with at least 20 million applications installed on Facebook accounts every day and 7 million applications and websites integrated into the platform. Point six Zuckerberg also made bold but controversially expensive moves to expand the Facebook platform. Jeff Bezos Extraordinary attention to detail, users, and platforms if Zuckerberg appears to be following in Gates's footsteps. Jeff Bezos seems akin in many ways to Steve Jobs. He has been incredibly focused on delivering a great consumer experience. He has shown the ability to drive one innovation after another into the market, including the Kindle and Amazon web services. And he enjoys crushing the competition. That's one of the things I think is so highly leveraged that I am involved from heading level 1 all the way to heading level 5. 8 more broadly and very similar to Steve Jobs. Bezos focused his attention on anything that directly affected the customer experience. Point nine one former colleague recalled, the good and the bad of Jeff is that he wanted to be involved with every new web change. Even if it was just to change the colors of a tab. 10 An Amazon engineer put it more colorfully saying that Bezos makes ordinary control freaks look like stoned hippies. 11. This approach seems to have played off. Ma received a degree in computer science from Shenzhen University and worked on internet paging systems at a telecommunications company before founding Tencent, China's largest internet company. In 1998.12 he and his four co-founders looked forward by studying internet services in more advanced economies and reasoned back to introduce the free QQ instant messaging service in 1999. Nonetheless, despite this heightened self-awareness, Gates, Grove, 
and Jobs all fell short in some measure when it came to anticipating what type of leadership their companies might need in the future. A future when they would no longer be in charge. So the final lessons we can learn from these masters of strategy are really two notes of caution. Personal anchors can ground you but also hold you back. And executives who are compliments may be essential to your success. But they may not be substitutes for your leadership. Microsoft is gradually diversifying its sources of profits. But the new leadership team will have to learn how to make money with lower priced or free software as well as new models of pricing and delivery, such as software as a service and cloud computing. Products such as the iWatch may well prove to be another major source of growth for Apple but, once more, we do not see Apple opening up its new platform to the majority of smartphone users, which rely on software from Google. It's just that we always believed that our role was going to be to make things that contributed to the greater glory of the PC. 15. This was the attitude that led Microsoft to use the same operating system, the widely panned but technically novel Windows 8, for PCS as well as smartphones and tablets. So, you know, you either produce things that are not a compelling experience or were too expensive or both.16. Similarly, Intel's focus on the core microprocessor business for Windows computers made it difficult to transition to new growth areas. As Les Vadas pointed out, due to Grove's decision to narrow the company's focus on a very narrow part of the PC business, the company continuously found itself void of technology depth in neighboring technologies that it increasingly needed. 17 Grove talked at strategy meetings in the company and to the outside world about diversifying beyond the x86 architecture. But he never committed the same level of personal time, focus, attention, and, most important, corporate resources, to win in those new businesses, early in his tenure. For example, Craig Barrett went on a $12 billion buying spree in the dot-com boom, which proved to be a total write-off. And Steve Ballmer spent more than $20 billion on acquisitions, including the $7 billion Hail Mary acquisition of Nokia to save the Windows smartphone business. Their solution for the succession problem was to run visible horse races, giving a number of senior managers the opportunity to demonstrate that they could be the next great lead up point one nine rather than loyalty driving the eventual decision two dark horses jack welch and john reed emerged from the competitions